exactly. part one. Yeah. Well, why don't we, um, can I push through, yeah. through the, next the rest of the agenda, agenda right. and then we'll have time for Sabrina at one, and then we'll probably break yeah, for good right after that. Right. Fine. Not for good, but till then. Okay, well, let's, um, why don't we, why don't we go to, since, you know, we've had the caveat the last year or so on our agenda that public participation isn't necessarily 1.30, so yeah. we have a few right now. Maybe it Anybody would be appropriate that? to take them so that they don't have to uh, wait since they're here. I do. I have two forms. Um, we'll start with Steve Horn and John Bracey. Uh, Mr. Horn is the chair, and Mr. Bracey is the executive director of the Michigan Council for the Arts Cultural Affairs. And you have one of those cool glasses that goes from dark, dark to light, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I like that. Well, thanks for this opportunity. Yeah. And um, <laughs> first of all, I need to apologize. Uh, Steve Horn, Chairman Horn, uh, called this morning and, and is not going to be able to join us. And he, uh, Steve asked me to, uh, in particular, apologize to uh, Ms. Strauss because he was really <laughs> looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> um, you know, uh, often you can find yourself uh, thinking that you're the center of the universe. I do it all the time, at least my wife says I do. And uh, and when you do that, you you kind of get the the impression that everyone knows what you're doing, and uh, you know that that's just not true. So I wanted to take this opportunity. It's been a, a while since I've been here before you, to tell you a couple of things that the council has been working on, and um, that that I think that you'll be interested in, and uh, and, and hopefully this is a, a habit that can we can start uh, getting into. Um, as you know, and this certainly won't be anything innovative. This is uh, far from it. It's a very traditional uh, topic, first of all. Um, our, our client base is primarily the, the arts and cultural organizations in the state of Michigan. And uh, although we do work with some schools, primarily we work with symphonies and museums. And where you can call up right now on your computer screens and, and, and see the the Diego Rivera murals at the DIA, or you can hear uh, something that the DSO has, has played, or you can visit Meyer Gardens and, and see what's happening there. You can experience it. Mm -hmm. And we've um, been hearing for some time from our clients <coughs> that um, field trips with schools have been declining at uh, uh, just at scary rates. <laughs> Alarming rate. And so we decided to test that this year. And uh, even though our, our funding it has been drastically cut, uh, even, uh, even while we were part of the Department of History, Arts, and Libraries, we were experiencing cuts, and, and of course those cuts have continued. Uh, the council felt very strongly this year that they were going to uh, uh, carve out a, a small bit of money to see uh, if we couldn't help some of the schools visit some of our clients. and. Um, and so we put together a very quick grant program, um, school bus grants, and um, we received, a, I think the turnaround was less than, less than a month. It, it was right around a month that schools had to complete an application and get it into us. Uh, we received 303 applications, far, far more than uh, I was expecting and uh, far more than we could possibly um, afford to fund. They were just small grants for, for gas. This is gas money, you know, $500 at, at the most for a school. I did bring a, a, a few copies of the list of those grants. We were able to fund 162 of those schools in, and, uh, in 44 counties. So we tried to spread it around. And I'll leave these for you. You can do what you want. I, if you would like uh, copies of them electronically. They are on our website by county. I can give you all kinds of this information uh, uh, via an email. So if you decide you want more. Um, I, I will say one thing uh, about the school grants, uh, the school bus grants, and that is it, it was a, a huge amount of work and uh, really troubling to read some of the grant applications and they were small. And uh, Anna Cardona here within the Department of Education um, agreed to read some of the grant applications for us, and it, it, so we're indebted to her. Anna's over Again. here, by the way, on our right, so thank you, Anna. Um, the, 
I haven't had the opportunity to actually uh, go through because uh, of the shortness of the time frame to tell you how many students are, are going to be visiting uh, our, some of our clients from those 162 schools. Uh, I can't tell you for certain um, what the percentage of, of schools that I read, because I read all 303 applications, I would guess that somewhere in that 75 percent, perhaps larger, uh, of the schools that applied to us said that they no longer had field trips, that this was the only opportunity <coughs> they had for our students uh, our st in the state to visit one of our, our clients. 30 minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, minutes, that being the case, minutes. some people are Eileen. <laughs> That's about <laughs> right. I, that, but, but you're going to take the laughter yeah. as often. Well, right? uh, yeah. uh, that, that being the case, uh, I think that there's a real issue that maybe the council and, and the, the board can have a, a further discussions on it. And we, we want you to know that we stand ready to partner with you in, in any way that uh, possible. And I'm going to make uh, a, a much more effort to make sure that you understand everything else that we're doing. The other thing really quickly, the National Endowment for the Arts Poetry Out Loud competition was held this past weekend. Um, and in all, 30, 30 of the state schools uh, participated. They sent 23 school champions. And in, in all, at those 30 schools in the recitation uh, competition, some 4,500 students were involved in, in learning and reciting poetry and involved in this competition. It was an amazing event. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about that as well. And uh, anytime you have questions, you know I'm here. Thank you. So Thank, much. You Thank, you Thank you very much. Our other speaker today is Chris Hansen from Lansing, and he is here to speak about math in color. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, let me start by complimenting President Strauss on a great choice of color for today. Oh. <laughs> we didn't even call each other and we match. Right. <laughs> That's the non-threatening color, uh, meaning uh, when <laughs> Obama gave the latest, what was the latest, or they, when they did that health care summit, I heard commentators talking about how all the politicians were wearing the blue color ties, <laughs> because it's one everybody likes, you know, it's not oh, too right. scary, <laughs> it's not too mean, it's not too soft, it's just <laughs> very, uh, right. Right. can't wear my blue <laughs> ties anymore, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, found and out. yet I see no blue ties here. I Just usually like have one. <laughs> no one's I'm wearing the mean. Tiger Woods red, the <laughs> hardcore, <laughs> aggressive yeah, color. You. Anyway, um, my name is Chris Hansen. I am a teacher in the Lansing School District, and I have been a teacher since 2001. My company is called Hansen Education LLC. I recently invented and patented a color-coded number system that uses four number charts, and uh, I've already sold thousands of these double-sided sheets and hundreds of accompanying uh, handouts, which you have with you today. This covers 37 different grade level content expectations from grades K through 5. And today I'd like to share my invention with you and offer the state of Michigan a licensing agreement that would very inexpensively uh, put these in every classroom in the state of Michigan. If you look at the first image, I have a typical multiplication chart that I assigned a color for every number from 1 through 10. You can easily take the 2, which is red, multiply it by the blue, which is 3, and then you've got 2 times 3 is 6 right inside the box. On the other side, I have 9 100 charts, and all of those show color coding for multiples. This really helps kids skip count and see the patterns. The really significant thing, though, is the composite of these colors. I took uh, one 100 chart and put all the color codes along with the numbers inside the colors on a chart. So if you look at 48, you can instantly see that 48 is a multiple of 2, 3, 4, 6, and 8, and 47 is a prime number. On the flip side of that, I have a chart from 101 to 200 because this is something that teachers want. Currently at teacher stores, you cannot get a chart that has 101 to 200. Um, so no, I normally sell these for a dollar each sheet, 
and six dollars for posters like this. And like I've said, I've already sold hundreds of the uh, posters and thousands of the handouts, and I have an offer from a major publishing group to purchase the patent, but I don't want to do that because that would basically be a buy and die. What they'd do is they'd buy it from me. It would never see the light of day. It would never help kids learn because uh, they just want to keep the status quo. Status quo. Um, however, I am willing to offer the state a licensing agreement for $1 per student, and then the state could print as many copies as they feel necessary from a Michigan printing company. You could get sheets like this for less than 10 cents a piece, posters for less than a dollar a piece, and there's an explanation of how that works on the uh, page right here that kind of shows how that would end up saving the state a lot of money and, like uh, John said earlier, have a major system change rather than just a small pilot, something that would be in inexpensive yet effective. Uh, this is something that works. It is based on research. I have a master's from Central Michigan University, and I developed this while I was at Central Michigan University. There are 23 different studies that support color-aided learning. I have many testimonials from different teachers, and uh, I just wanted to take the opportunity to share this with you. So thank you very much. Please look it over, and please uh, contact me regarding this. Thank you very much. From Eric Hink Hinkle yeah. from Grand Rapids here representing the resource heating solutions. Basically what uh, I'm here to talk about is a uh, program that was developed by um, a school district in Purdy, Missouri, and it was funded by the company that I rep or I don't represent, where the manufacturers rep for them. That's a clean burn waste oil furnace, and it was a recycling program that set was set up by the Purdy, Missouri. Um, Spanish club and they set up this whole program where they did all recycling and they actually turned it into a profit so that they were able to offer scholarships, were able to do class trips, were able to do stuff like that. Um, and not only were they doing that but they were offering a service to the community as far as recycling. Um, the reason why Clean Burn funded it is because Clean Burn it makes a uh, furnace that burns on used crankcase oil, um, transmission fluid, all that kind of stuff. And where one of their major sources for their oil to, to heat their facility while, well, you know, they were doing all their work in there and everything like that came from their school bus <coughs> fleet because they produce all the waste oil and everything like that. So they were, you know, recycling that. The school wasn't having to pay to have the oil hauled away. They weren't having to pay to have their oil filters taken away. We actually have probably about four or five school districts in the state of Michigan right now that have these furnaces that are just running them at their current facilities. Um, one of them, Zeeland Public Schools, has had it for 15 years and by having this furnace has probably saved their heating bill on that building $100,000 over 15 years on a uh, purchase of a $5,000 furnace. So, the, you know, they paid $5,000 and have saved over $100,000. I know Michigan offers the, you know, free state funded program for energy efficiency, the clean burn furnaces, completely fall within the energy efficiency program so there's grants out there that for the schools that can purchase the units and also to start up recycling programs for the uh, the schools themselves where they can you know I mean it takes Michigan you know because we're trying to look at ourselves as as a green state to bring in green jobs and to do you know, things like that, where in the school now we can actually have programs where we're teaching the kids about green jobs, where they're actually participating 
in green jobs. So when they're, you know, a kid graduates from a Michigan school, they've been educated in the process of, you know, what it takes to be green, not just the, the recycling end of it, but the business end of it too, because they'll be, they'd be working a recycling center, not only just to, you know, take in papers and recycle and whatnot, they'd be doing it for profit so that they can make <laughs> money to fund, you know, like I said, scholarship programs, uh, activities for the school, like the other gentleman was talking about, um, you know, to take a field trip that would have cost $500, which could have easily been funded through doing, you know, something like this. You know, so it not only helps out uh, the school districts on saving money, uh, helps them out on being energy efficient, a positive image for recycling, um, you know, and as far as you know, what the students goes, it it gives them another sort of education into certain fields that they would normally not get education in. Which, you know, in an, in the world right now, that's starting to become a very large part of where the job market can be going is in in the green area, the recycling area, the you know all that kind of stuff. So, you know, and what I am also proposing too on the deal is to help out the Michigan schools. I've got it in the deal here that we are as resource heating systems, not just for clean burn, but are offering a 20% uh, off price for from the list price on the furnaces to any school district that wants to participate because being in Michigan myself, you know, I want to see Michigan grow itself and I'm willing to put this out there to the school district so that they can, you know, I know all school districts are financially strapped and if this is something that maybe $500 or $1,000 is going to stop them from saving, you know, a thousand or $100,000 over the period of time, I'm, I'm willing to take that hit myself to, to help out the school district. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's it on public participation. Why don't we go into the regular meeting? Um, good, af good afternoon, I guess it is. Um, the time is now 12.52, and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Ed meeting of March 9, 2010 is called to order. The first item is the approval of minutes and regular committee of the whole meeting of February 9th. Is there a motion? So moved. It's moved by Cass, supported by <laughs> Sandra. <laughs> um, any changes or all? All in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, same. Second item is approval of minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of February 17th. I move approval. By, by Liz, supported by John. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you. Mr. Kathleen. We had two sets of minutes. Yes. So Can you get we do both of them? And both? Both? No, I did the ninth first. Oh, okay. Can we do a phone check, Marianne? Nancy? Okay, I just want to make sure we get the vote for Okay. We have their president's report. Yeah, we got enough. Yeah. Kath, president's report, please. Well, uh, it was an interesting month <laughs> in more ways than one. It's the last regular meeting and then the special meeting. Um, I, I just wanted to say that Reggie and Cassandra and I were at a, a forum that on the future of Detroit just about a month ago uh, that was sponsored by the Brookings Institution and Time Magazine. And uh, John Austin was one of the panelists, and not only was one of the panelists, but he was the one who organized the whole thing. Um, his hat as a Brookings Fellow, and he was very eloquent as always. We were very proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only sorry I didn't get a chance to shout out my fellow board members in that <laughs> particular context. Well, it was really, it was quite an impressive gathering of hundreds of people. I mean, it was a big, big gathering. And the other speakers were Mayor Dave Bing and uh, Steve Hamp, who's been involved in this program of creating the, th the 35 charter schools in Detroit, new schools that will be small and supposedly good. Uh, and Doug, uh, uh, Stephen Gray, who's the uh, reporter from Time Magazine. I don't know if all of you know Time Magazine 
has bought a house in Detroit, and <coughs> they have a group of reporters who are there full time, and, and they, I guess, they're looking at Detroit to see what happens to a city and whether it can come back, and so on and so forth. So it was really quite interesting. And Carol Goss from the uh, the president of the Skillman Foundation was the other speaker. So it was quite an impressive. Mayor Bing. Mayor Bing, I mentioned him, and it, it, it was quite impressive. And John was the major domo, so we were very proud of him. Uh, and then Liz and I were at the Floyd Elementary School in in Midland, actually the Bullock Creek <coughs> School District, last week. Uh, to read, she was part. It's March Reading Month, and they invited us to to read to the kids, which is always fun. But they, we, we, I read to a kindergarten and first grade class, and Liz read to a first grade, second grade class, and the kids are very responsive. Little kids are so into it. And the, the kindergarten class, I read to them, and the second, the first grade class, they knew the book that we all did it together. They sort of did it from memory. And it was fun. But then the principal invited us to have lunch with students, one from each class in the building. And that was really interesting because they were very natural and they tell you what's on their minds and they really know what's going on. So it was very good because the school obviously is, is a good school and the principal is very sharp. And he has a, he does what we say people the school people should do, which is invite policymakers into the building to see what goes on. He had had Dave Camp, Congressman Dave Camp, had read to the kids the day before, and he said he was so glad to be there because the kids didn't know who he was and he could be himself, <laughs> didn't have to <laughs> say anything special or <laughs> or be careful what he said. <laughs> the kids just liked him. I'd have a break. Someone that's. I thought yeah. Carolyn would like They like him. They yeah. really <laughs> like him. Yeah. 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 So Sally Fields. And he had, uh, when we we were coming and the, the previous reader was leaving and he was the anchor man for the television station. So then he interviewed us both, but I don't know if we ever got on television. We never heard about any program, any, any interviews playing actually. but. But he was bringing in, and, and he was having members of the legislature the following day, uh, the rest of the week. So he was doing it just the way you're supposed to. But when you walk into the building, there's a big sign on it that says, School of Academic Excellence. And that's what their whole thing is geared to achieving. And the kids are a very diverse group from very uh, poverty stricken to pretty wealthy. and. Uh, the, the, the boy that was sitting across from me at lunch was the student council president in the fifth grade. And uh, he plans to go to Harvard. And I said, well, you know, Harvard isn't the only college, you know. You, oh, I know I could go to Yale. <laughs> 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 but the, the, and the, and the little girl was the secretary of the student council, was very articulate kids. And, uh, Liz had a great time because they, one of the kids brought a book over and they're looking at the book and she had a word she didn't know, Liz didn't know it, the principal didn't know it, they couldn't, they brought a dictionary, it wasn't in the dictionary, they got a better dictionary, it wasn't in that dictionary. <laughs> when Liz got home, she looked at an unabridged dictionary and found the word and emailed them immediately to <laughs> that it really was a word, it wasn't a misprint or a typo. We thought we had found a typo, we were so <laughs> excited. But, we didn't. We just but when we were there, we were there, it Big happened word. to be Dr. Seuss's birthday is, 106th birthday, yeah. and one of the teachers was dressed up like the cat in the hat character with the hat. And the, in the afternoon, they were going to have a birthday party to celebrate Dr. Seuss's birthday. So the, the talking about engaging students in their learning, they really were engaged and excited. It was, it was really good to see. Kathleen, um, this is an added to that. Congressman Camp's father-in-law died last week. Oh, really? Yeah, and the service is tomorrow. Oh, oh my God. So that would have been somewhere in that time frame. Well, that's interesting. Maybe it was the next day or something. I first. thought they said Tuesday, and I was surprised they were keeping him that long, but oh. I don't know. That's interesting. Hmm. Well, anyway, that was a, f a fun visit. It's a great way to get into a school and see what's going on. So um, then uh, Liz... Nancy and I attended this conference that I mentioned, the MSU College of Education Conference on International, as I 
internationalizing education. And the, the speaker of the morning was really outstanding. His name is Kai Basher. He's the operational director of the uh, specialist school and, uh, oh, what is this? I can't read my own writing. Something Trust in, Eng in London, England. And uh, he showed, uh, he was using the, the internet the whole time and showed what kids do with it. Uh, one kid decided to, he's gonna go around Went right around the world dancing in every capital, or not necessarily capital, cities around the world, and kids were learning geography from this. I mean, it was just fascinating. He did it on his own, then he managed to get funding so he could keep going for a year. He did it for a couple months on his own. And they're very creative, and they, they can do things that we don't even think of. At least I don't even think of, but they. It, just what was said here today, the kids think differently today, and they use the computer and, and text and phones and texting and whatever they do so much that they don't, they don't even think. I saw a comic strip yesterday with it. They talk about the newspaper, and the, uh, the newspaper, I, and the kid says, what's a newspaper? You know, Kids don't even know it. A lot of them, they don't know what a newspaper is. So they won't in a couple of years. You know, it's just, it's just a different way of thinking. And how do you engage students in their own education? That was the focus of this whole talk. And it can be done. And they, where this guy is, is in a, not a rich area at all. He, 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 he works in, a, in an area of poor working class neighborhoods and. They have got, they've done this, and Barbara Markle said that she had visited some of the schools that they're in, and she said it, it really is amazing. It really works the way they approach it. So there are different ways of looking at things, and they're using a lot more online, as, as these folks said today. So that's really uh, personalized training, and, and, and it's, it's, it's really very interesting. And then in the afternoon, there were very interesting breakout sessions. I attended one with Bill Skilling, the superintendent of Oxford. And I had been there, what was the last Blue Ribbon presentations we had, when they had two of their elementary schools receive Blue Ribbons and they had the presentation, they had the kids come to the high school and, and among the things that they did was they had a little orchestra. But one of the, Bill's approach is that Academics, arts, and athletics are all three important for educating kids. And because of that, he started this orchestra. And it, they're now up to 500, 300 kids in the orchestra, and various orchestras, and they, he's hoping to get 500. And when he came, uh, he said just before he took office, he went to a board meeting and they were debating what they should charge for pay to play and uh, for athletics. And he s they asked him what he thought, and he said, well, I'm gonna recommend that you eliminate pay to play. <laughs> he thought that if athletics are important for all kids to participate, they shouldn't be charged for it. So one of the first things he got the board to do was eliminate pay to play and agree to refund the money to the parents who had already paid. Mm -hmm. So they refunded $80,000 to parents and it made the news, the national news, he was on the, to, to the Today Show, he said, or other thing. But he, he's very creative and imaginative. And what he said he was, he heard a presentation by uh, Dennis Toffolo, who was the deputy executive in Oakland County in charge of economic development. And he talked about the international companies that were that were already in Oakland County and how many he expected to see in the next couple of years, something like 2,000 and up to 5,000 companies. And Bill Skilling's reaction was, well, if they, they're gonna attract a lot and get all these companies to come here, what do our kids need? And I, so he asked the question, I said foreign languages. He said, absolutely. So uh, they teach Spanish and, and Mandarin Chinese. And because he believes in the arts, the third foreign language, it's not a foreign language, the third language is music. So all kids from kindergarten on get music and 
one of the least Spanish or Mandarin, and they, he wants them all to be not only uh, be able to read it, but be proficient and fluent in speaking it by the time they leave eighth grade. And they will get it every year from the time they are in kindergarten. So uh, there are all kinds of things, and he said it, the, one of the things he got rid of because he had to be able to do this was home ec. He said they were still teaching home economics. Not that that's not important, but this is more important at this point. They can get that in other ways. So there are all he was full of ideas, and the people were just gobbling, people in the audience were just gobbling up these ideas. So there are interesting things going on in the schools at Michigan, very creative. And, when, and I know I'm one who doesn't, I, I don't like all the standardized testing. It's too much of it and all this stuff. But it doesn't mean because we have standardized testing that you cannot be creative. And as, as, as uh, Mike said, the, the frameworks give them the freedom to be creative. Instead of seeing it as a restriction, he sees it as an opportunity. <coughs> that's, that's half the battle. Yeah. yeah. Oxford, seeing the glass, by the way, is... Ha seeing the, the glass is half full yeah, instead of half empty. empty. Oxford's one of our project reimagined districts, yeah. as you know, and right. has a number of waivers. Well, he said he made the commitment that they were going to do it whether they got a grant from Race to the Top or not. They were already doing it. Yeah. So, uh, and on top of all that, he has actually... I didn't want to say this before Iris was here, but he's actually increased their fund equity <laughs> from a couple of million to five million or something like that, if I remember the figures correctly. So then that night, with the three of us, well, Liz, Nancy went with her husband, but Liz and I went to Wardcliffe Elementary School, where Rob Stevenson, our wonderful teacher of the year, has started this so-called science convention, which started with his third graders. But now, over the years, it's grown to include the whole school. And the kids were there with their families and their siblings. And he had speakers from the Abrams Planetarium and from other places. But the kids were so engaged, again, they were explaining their projects to us. These just third graders explaining the science. I don't think I ever learned that in school. I mean, these, it's just amazing. And Rob's classroom is fantastic. <coughs> it's like a miniature planetarium. He's got things all over the walls. It covers the walls, the ceilings. You turn out the lights, you see the stars. And kids were coming in and showing their parents their classroom. They were so pleased with it. And he really is the teacher of the year. He is yeah, an yes. adult. But that was a very uh, rewarding experience as well. So I think that's uh, that was that's my report for the for the day. Great. We, we probably only have like two minutes of, of business, yeah. and then we could go. I know Sabrina Keeley is yeah. here, and then we could end with that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to forego my report, and um, but are there any questions on the on the items in the report? Okay. Sure. Then we can move to consent agenda. Um, I move we adopt the consent agenda as presented. Moved by Liz. Support. Supported by Reggie. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Uh, any comments by board members at this time? I just, I just want to give a P.S. to our reading day in um, in Midland because it was, it was, it fits with the kinds of comments we've heard about technology and everything today. So I was talking with the second graders about all the ways that you use reading, and and one of them we. Was, they were guessing all things, and one kid said maps, and I said, so how do you use reading for the map? And the little girl said, well, you can read the name of the cities and the states, or you could just get a GPS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different world. Second grade. Yes, so just get a GPS. <laughs> well, thank you, and I know, <laughs> is Kath or John so going to make the formal uh, uh, introduction of our well, guest? I think John will. John, and please, John. Sabrina, please join us. Thank you, too, for being available. Yeah. Um, you've seen, I think, Sabrina, the last few months, our efforts to um, reflect on and then inform some recommendations we want to make about <coughs> education from early childhood, really, to higher ed revenues, reforms, uh, and investment uh, needs and opportunities as well as restructuring needs and opportunities informed by the good work that many folks in Michigan are doing to try to help us 
see how we structure our education system to be effective. And uh, appreciate um, your willingness on behalf of the uh, business leaders from Michigan. Uh, Sabrina is the uh, the deputy or chief operating officer. Many of you know uh, Doug Rothwell, who and Sabrina recently sort of renamed and expanded the mission, I gather, of Detroit Renaissance to focus on uh, the statewide needs and opportunities. And so appreciate the work you've done and uh, appreciate your sharing with us sort of your um, analysis and your set of recommendations for how we think about our state's current economic position, budget, and, and education-related implications of those as much as you're eager to uh, share and guide us in our, in our consideration. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk to you. I know you've had some very esteemed speakers before me this morning, um, some of whom we've worked with. I have a, a PowerPoint I'd like to share, and I think, did you say B? B is in boy. <laughs> here we go. Yeah. And I'm sorry, which one of these? There we go. Okay. <coughs> I also have here, actually, we, we've put together something that we call our Michigan Turnaround Plan that we've been having around the state. So this is a copy of the PowerPoint. This is the full Thank report. Thank you. If you want a copy of that. I would just like to take a minute to tell you who we are as business leaders from Michigan. We are a membership organization comprised of about 75 of the state's most prominent company CEOs, four university presidents. We represent over four, I'm sorry, 300,000 jobs throughout the state representation in every county in the state and over a trillion dollars in annual revenue and over 100,000 um, higher education students. And I say that not to tout who we are, but to show that my members are very invested in the state. They live here. They've got hundreds of thousands of employees here. Um, they are very much concerned about the talent that is coming out of our system, so they're, they're very committed to this endeavor. Eileen, what am I doing wrong? I'm coming. Okay, now if you just click on the right. Okay, great. Thank you. Actually, on the left. Oh, I'm sorry. The other left. <laughs> yeah, the other Thank right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to touch on just a little bit. Uh, this was the impetus for our members coming together to put together a plan, but the, the downside of where we are, we've got a, a tremendous problems in our state that everyone is, is trying to gather on to solve. Since the year 2000, one out of every two jobs lost in the state have been in Michigan. Frankly, I think it's been about 60%. Only 25% of those job losses have been from the automotive sector. Mm -hmm. Businesses pay on average in Michigan a 3 to 4 percentage uh, point profit penalty to be here. Um, we've got declining population growth, declining per capita income, and no real plan that everyone has gathered around to try to fix this. Um, these slides just show how we've been below the national average in terms of population growth, in terms of our per capita income is now 37th, soon to reach 40th. We used to be much, much higher in the state. We are the tax revenue coming into the state, as you are seeing, um, flat or declining the exception of that little bump up in 2007, which was the tax increase. Um, spending priorities for the state. This is how we've looked from 2000 to 2009 in just a handful of categories. You can see the dotted line is the inflation rate. Um, we like to look in particular at corrections and higher ed as a comparison, and then of course revenue sharing to cities. We don't necessarily think that these should be the right priorities for our state understanding that the needs dictate some of this, but we think we need to be more proactive in setting some of the priorities. This just really talks, uh, um, is de designed to show how we rank compared to a lot of our competitor states or the top 10 states in the country on a number of business climate issues. And so really, no matter which factors you look at, whether it's labor, <coughs> Uh, regulatory costs, uh, taxes, energy costs, we tend to be at the bottom end of the scale. And reality, on the facts on the left side, on the right side, is even <laughs> if it's just perception, perception makes a difference. So from CEOs and site location consultants, year after year after they're surveyed, you'll see for the last several years we have been ranked 48th out of 50th in the state. Uh, again, this gets to the what I just mentioned in terms of labor costs, energy costs, and taxes. So we digested a whole lot more information than this and came around the table and my member said we've got to do something. What do we want to do? We need to start with the goal. And the goal that we agreed upon was we should want to make our state top 10 in terms of job and economic growth. 
used to be there several decades ago. We'd like to get our state there again, recognizing it's going to take a long time. So in the short term, we are looking at can we just be above average? And we hear a lot from people who are saying, well, we're only average in this or we're average in that. You know, we're not that bad off. We don't happen to think average is a good thing. <laughs> We'd like to be much better than average. This will give you an idea, just picking a couple of factors, per capita income, job growth, and unemployment rate, where we stood in 2007 before the current recession. And if we had been in the top 10 at that time, where we would be. So per capita income would be almost $7,000 more, almost 900,000 more jobs between 2000 and 2007 and a much lower unemployment rate. Um, so the, the gist of our plan that we think can get us to this top 10 status is it's a Michigan turnaround plan. It's a five-step plan that will, um, step one, change the way we, we manage our finances at the state level. Step two would be right-sizing and enacting structural budget reforms. Step three would be making our, st our state more competitive to attract and retain jobs. Step four, making investments that create a great job environment. And step five, accelerating job growth through innovation and entrepreneurship. I'm sure some of this will come as no surprise to you, and you probably heard some of this from John Bebo this morning, some of these similar forms, reforms. In terms of changing the way we manage our finances, <coughs> we'd like to see two-year budgets. We'd like to see the private sector involved in some of the revenue estimating that the um, analysts do for the state. We, we would like to see the, the picture for the state's revenues and expenses um, plotted out for more than a one-year time frame. So we know problems are coming up in 2012. We know it right now we're looking at 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, and yet the legislature is focused on the budget for 2011, and if they can patch it together with enough federal stimulus money, we know there's a big cliff we're all going to be falling off of in 2012. So we'd like to see a longer-term forecast. A um, lot of reforms that are on the table. Um, bottom line, put it simply, is we'd like to see our government live within its means. There have been some really tough decisions and a lot of cuts have been made over the last many years, um, but the problem has not gone away. Still a real big problem and so we've identified a number of reforms. They don't all have to be the ones we've identified, but some include uh, state employee uh, concessions because like any business, government's biggest costs tend to be on the labor side. So looking at uh, state compensation levels, workforce levels, Co-pays for um, employee premiums. Um, Screening, just one second. Mm -hmm. we just find it? Nancy, Nancy or Mary Ann, did you just join us? Anybody on the phone? Uh, yes, I, I'm here. Oh, good. I'm, so, I've never left. I've been here the whole time. Okay, we weren't sure, um, but th thank you. So Nancy Danhoff and Mary McGuire. Sabrina Keeley is, uh, is sharing um, Business Leaders for Michigan presentation, which I don't know if they have the PowerPoint email to them. them. Okay. okay, we'll try to do that. Sorry, Sabrina. Thank it's okay. Uh, continue on. Some additional reforms would be at the local government and school district level to encourage uh, service sharing, um, whether it's uh, transportation services, food services, custodial services. Um, what can we do to encourage some of our 1,800 units of local government and over 500 school districts to look at sharing some back-end services, not necessarily consolidating governments or districts, but sharing some back-end services that could perhaps save some, some money. Looking at additional <coughs> reforms in the correction system, we have seen from a National Center for Justice report that we tend to put away more people for longer periods of time and it costs us more than most of the other Great Lakes states. So we'd like to see some reforms that would bring our costs in line because they're significant costs and they continue to dramatically increase every year in the correction system. And perhaps now because our budget is so constrained, we could look at eliminating optional services that we provide that the federal government doesn't provide or those services that are duplicated from what the federal government provides. And we'd like to see a reform of our business tax structure. We're currently anywhere between 27th and 34th, 35th worst, depending on which measure you use. We think it would be helpful to look at putting together a system that makes us more competitive so it would reduce the business tax costs, would also provide a more stable revenue base for the state, and would look at the growing economy. And right now, we tend to tax products, manufacturing, <coughs> excuse me, we all know we're becoming more and more of a service economy and we're ignoring that whole component. So we have a tax proposal that would 
extend the uh, sales tax to services and reducing the overall rate among a number of things but it would provide a more stable revenue base for our state and would work significantly toward bumping us up in terms of being more competitive for a business cost uh, structure. And the last two steps of our plan really focus on investing in the future and what kinds of things should we be doing. We have not fleshed this component out as much because we don't have the revenues at this point in time and, and the fire before us is really on the, the um, revenue side. But we believe that we should be investing, we should be prioritizing our expenses. We've really not do, done that as much in the past. We've had the luxury of being a fairly rich state. We are now quite a poor state. And we think we should be putting our, our state monies into areas that are going to give us the longest term economic impact, things <coughs> like higher education, things like infrastructure, things like reinvesting in our cities, our urban areas, and recognizing that we have this tremendous asset of the Great Lakes and how can we <coughs> excuse me, invest around that to help us out over the long term. <coughs> so for education, you probably have much better data than we had on this, but we show performance. Our spending is at eighth highest level in the country and performance is at 34. So we'd like to see some improvement there. We'd like to see an increase in investment to higher education scale. Um, maybe we can't afford to have 15 universities around the state, maybe we have to look at where our strengths are, identify those that we can support and rationalize the others. Maybe we need an overall body like this one that oversees all of the universities in the state. <coughs> we don't have all the right answers, but we're putting proposals out there. We'd like to make sure that we have top-notch infrastructure. You probably all experienced our declining roads, we've got issues with roads, bridges. Um, we think it's important that we maintain really top-notch uh, transportation infrastructure, mm -hmm. that we have great free freeway connectivity to adjoining states, <coughs> excuse me, that we have mass transit and dense population areas. We think it's really important to have an urban agenda to reinvest in our cities, that we have a comprehensive Great Lakes strategy. Um, there is a lot of, of research and, and discussion about the younger generation and the knowledge worker and what are they interested in and how do we maintain them. We know that, that vibrant cities are very important to them. We know that um, mass transit is very important to them and we think we need to look at investing in those types of things. <coughs> we also think it's important to reward areas that are collaborating across the state. So whether it's grants or incentives or other types of things that the state does, we think it would be helpful to encourage maybe with a carrot and a stick approach. So if, if the, you got a group of cities that are willing to work together and a couple other that are not, you incent and give a little more to those that are willing to collaborate, collaborate on a regional level. We think it'd be important to look at all of the policies that the uh, uh, governing <coughs> all the programs and services that the state provides and really look at how do we enhance, how do we reward those that are collaborating regionally and not reward those that are not. We'd like to see um, more support go into innovation and entrepreneurship, <coughs> excuse me, across all sectors rather than targeting specific industries. Things like expanding business accelerators and incubators, so expanding their capacity so they can take on more. We know entrepreneurship is a real big key for helping us grow jobs for the future. And um, also looking at s developing strategies that leverage our key assets, engineering for example, there are some who have taken some pot shots at the MEDC. We tend to support what they do. We think there's a very important need for what they do, um, but we think perhaps they can tailor their strategies a little more differently than what they've done in the past. So we put together this plan last fall. We've been around the state talking to virtually everybody about it. Um, we've shared it with the media. We've shared it with legislators, with local communities. We've got the support and endorsements of about 75% of the major newspapers in the state. We've gotten support from several major organizations and associations, Democrats, Republicans. We're kind of spreading the word, if you will. We will, in the next 30 or so days, be launching a, a much larger, broader public information campaign. Um, we're kind of taking three different tracks on this. We've got a legislative <coughs> agenda that is comprised of 10 steps of the overall plan. We've been working top down, bottom up. We continue to work with the governor and the legislative leaders. We also continue to work with individual legislators, particularly a group of freshmen that is very anxious to see 
some things change. Um, small print here in our legislative agenda, 10 items. We don't feel that we necessarily have all the answers, so these are 10 that we picked. They can be somebody else's 10. They can be a combination of, of other groups. We just like to see some significant reforms that are going to be made that are going to help us fix the structural deficit that our state faces. We have formed a political action committee. Um, my members are very serious about this. We've got questionnaires out to all of the gubernatorial candidates. We'll be interviewing them soon and we'll be sending the questionnaires out to all candidates running for any uh, legislative office, House or Senate. And we are going to be ranking them solely on their support for this type of a turn our turnaround plan. So we'll be contributing <coughs> financially, publicly with endorsements, all based on primarily what's in our plan. Are they willing to take the tough ste steps that we feel need to, to be taken? And, and then lastly, we have a, a web page and a whole viral uh, Twitter and Facebook and all that good stuff. Um, so I, I will stop there. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So who are our today's gubernatorial candidates? Pardon? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Out, I, you're in a day, you're out a day. Right. Right. So it's coming to a norm here. Michael Patrick Shields asked me on the air, by the way, and I said, no, I am not a candidate. So. There's still time. There's still time. Uh, board member, questions, comments, please. Well, first, let me thank you. We're really pleased to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. And I know that you put in a, oh, the business leaders as a group has put in a lot of thought, a lot of time and effort and thought into this, and it's, it's highly regarded. So we're very glad to have it as part of the mix that we're going to we're going to try to come together and make some recommendations of our own based on everything we've heard from you and all the other groups that we've heard from. Uh, we had the MEA here this morning and the AFT Michigan and. Uh, We've had the school administrators and school boards and principals and all the school associations. We've had economists left, right, and center. Uh, so we've really tried to get a cross section of all the groups and views that are out there and see if we can come together and make some kind of a bipartisan recommendation to the legislature and the governor to help solve the dilemma that we're in. So we really appreciate your being here. Well, I don't know, John, you want to ask? <coughs> yeah, just appreciate very much the comprehensive and kind of balanced approach that you all have ended up advocating, and particularly from, from my point of view, the recognition that there are sort of long-term investments that matter to our economy, whether it's our infrastructure or education or higher education, and that. On the, and that there's a combination of reforms and cost savings and efficiencies that are really important. Um, but can you, you, you also are suggesting that there is a structural sort of deficit on the revenue side that some combination of changes, a business tax change and a extension <coughs> of the sales tax. What is the exact nature of the business tax change and the uh, extension of the sales tax that you all are recommending or anything else that's kind of on the changes on how we raise money side? Sure. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry I did not clarify that. Um, the business tax change would be elimination of the surcharge that was enacted a couple of years ago, so the MBT surcharge, and it would be a reduction of the <coughs> gross receipts uh, tax rate in that surcharge from 0.8 to 0.45 percent. The governor's proposal recommends elimination of the surcharge over a couple of years and a reduction in the gross receipts rate from 0.8 to 0.6. So ours would take it a little further. Um, and the revenue coming in, so you would drop the, the sales tax rate on goods from 6 to 5.5%, and then you would extend that sales tax rate to services, not business to business services, not housing, education, or health care, mm -hmm. or any other services, or anything else that's currently taxed. Um, <coughs> it is revenue neutral in this current fiscal year, 2010, but over time provides additional revenue to the state. So I appreciate, John, you raising that because I want to say we don't, we don't feel, I mean, we're here representing the biz, big, big business community and some higher ed. Just taking care of that tax problem for the business community is not enough. We recognize that, nor is just you can't just cut your way out of this budget. We recognize that. So we're creating enemies all the way around. <laughs> <laughs> we think you need to do the budget reforms, the tax reform, and the priorities for spending longer term. Uh, Liz? Yeah. Um, 
Thank you, first of all, for this and for sharing the plan and for the thoughtful work that all of you have been doing. I, I think all of us appreciate it and want to be there. In, in terms of your step four, investing in our future, obviously there's lots of investments yes. one can make. But one that I uh, don't know if it was discussed, it's not here, is the investment in early childhood education because if our young people don't arrive at school with the capability of learning, it, they really don't ever catch up. And so the higher education opportunities become moot because they just never got the kind. And we do have long-term research that shows the economic return on investment in early childhood education, the high scope studies, and, and there's other. So. Um, uh, it, it may have been something you all talked about, and it's just not here on the PowerPoint, and if so, I'm, I uh, apologize for that. But I think it's something that's worth putting in the mix uh, and for the long-term investment in our state. And then the other thing I wanted to say is how much conversation do you all have with other states' leaders? I mean, you have a very good, widespread, intra-Michigan Group, is there a con are there conversations with other states that are? When you say leaders, other states' leaders, well, business leaders. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just thinking. You know, are we getting ideas from Massachusetts, from Pennsylvania, from the southern states? Sure. Um, you know, we have um, McKinsey and Company is represented on our board, and so they do benchmarking for mm -hmm. us. We have our members who are located in other states, so they talk to governors of those states and they talk to our peers. I mm -hmm. could not say to you, here are the five I ideas we've gotten from each of those mm -hmm. states, but there are conversations, maybe not to the degree that you're thinking. Yeah. I'm just thinking, because Min Michigan's a <coughs> peninsula, I've lived in a lot of different states, and, and I've always thought it was very interesting that in Michigan we talk to each other all yeah, the time and we don't seem to talk to anybody that's out there, and I know stuff's going on out there. <laughs> And because we're not on, you know, you have to make a decision to come mm -hmm. visit Michigan when you're going you east-west. You can go straight across the bottom and never come here. So I always, I, I used to call it peninsular thinking, but um, so I'm always looking to see, are, are we reaching out? Are we, are we get, grabbing ideas from other places and having those conversations? I, like you say, some of these people have to work in all those states, and they may be bringing that to the conversation. And let me also say, we have, as I mentioned, McKinsey uh, does a lot of work for us, and we're going to be coming out with a new benchmarking study where they benchmark us nationally um, later this month. So I can make sure you get a copy that of it. That would be very interesting. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not just business issues. I mean, it's quality of life, it's perception. It includes things like we rank really poorly on quality of life, but when people get here and say, I mean, we have a phenomenal, we, we, we compete with some of the best, but yeah. people don't get it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the perception is not so great there. So I'd be happy to share that with you. And just to your point about early childhood, I, we have not fleshed out all of the steps four and five. We're doing that. So I'll be happy to make a note to, to look Thank at you. that. I know um, our office is in Detroit, and I know the United Way down there has really got a big push <laughs> on early childhood. But you all did not sort of di discuss, debate it, and reject it. At right. No, right, no. Right. Right. Okay. I, just, I just wanted to raise its profile. <laughs> <laughs> Grand Haven, uh, Holland came in number two in quality of life just recently, that little area. I think it was Cassandra and then Reggie. Yeah. Th uh, first of all, thank you, Liz, for bringing up the early childhood um, <laughs> because I totally, I, I work for higher education, so I love the fact that you guys have higher ed in your priorities, but we have to start from the sure. beginning and then get up to the higher ed. I have a question on slide 14. You talk about the labor and benefit costs. And you say that the state employees in Michigan make, on average, $17,000 more than the private sector. Mm -hmm. What exactly are you comparing there? We're talking average uh, wages. So it's, I think it's $57,000 for the average state employee wage and $40,000 for the average pub private sector employee wage. And it is, the 57000 is $3,500 more than the national average for state employees. Okay. Do you guys How much higher than the national average? $3,500, okay. not as much. $3, Do you factor in education levels? You know, we've looked at that because I know someone else had come out and they felt it was not a good measure. So I'd be happy, I don't have all the data at my fingers, mm -hmm. I'd be happy to measure it for you, or to get you the information, but they looked at it and didn't feel it was an, an accurate comparison, just to right, use their right. words. Right, right. I guess that's what I would just, you know, express <coughs> a little bit of concern when we, we uh, you know, compare apples to oranges because I don't think it's it's quite fair when we expect our state employees to have uh, 
uh, you know, the education level that we expect of them and then compare them to, to individuals in another sector that might be a completely different expectation of them. But my board members would tell you they all expect their employees to have pretty high education levels. So, I mean, I'd be happy to get the information for you, but, but if you look even at just how our state, and, and this is not, again, I'm, I used to be state employee, so I have tremendous respect. I know they work really, really hard. But it, when you look even nationally, the wages are higher. And again, when you have only a dollar and you have to cut it, I mean, how do you, there's only so many ways you can slice the pie. It's just trying to get the budget balance is what these are designed to do. Yeah. Thank you. I would just throw that caution out there. Reggie okay. Twice. Sabrina, Hello. thanks for being here. We appreciate uh, your sharing your ideas with us, and we appreciate all the hard work that went into it. Um, uh, I think that Detroit Renaissance, now Business Leaders for Michigan, um, has been playing a very, very important role in our state for a long time. I, I support the broader focus to, to become you. business leaders for Michigan. Um, and I note that you still have a, an urban agenda in, yeah, in your platform, and there were some people who were concerned that that might, yep. that might go away. I don't, <laughs> right. I, but, but we know business leaders understand that the, yeah. that the state needs a strong mm -hmm. urban Absolutely. center um, to attract the kind of folks that we need um, to um, help us build a 21st century economy. Uh, I, I, um, I think that your uh, plan, uh, like John uh, said, is, is very balanced. Um, uh, it. Um, um, it requires some sacrifices all the way around. I mean, we're going to we're going to pay higher taxes um, and, and in years going forward, and I think there are people in the state who are prepared to, to do that. Um, but I but I think that in exchange for that, um, there has to be um, some recognition that that the sacrifice has to go all the way around. Mm -hmm. And I think this is um, that this is a time for shared sacrifice to make the investments that we need to make in our state for the future, um, and uh, it appears to me that, that your plan seeks to create that balance. Um, we heard um, some of the, the difficulties in striking that balance uh, pointed out earlier. Just take cor corrections, for example. Um, I mean, the, the numbers are just staggering in terms of, of the growth in our corrections budget over the course of time. Um, in 1973, it was less than 4% of our general fund budget. Today, it's over 20% of our general fund budget. And the statistics as we compare ourselves to other states and other nations, I mean, it's just yeah. way out of whack. Um, but, you know, the headlines over the weekend is, you know, you let people out. Um, um, you know, who do you let out and what do you do with them? Um, you know, are you, have you, you know, I guess uh, sharing in Liz's point, have you, have we looked at any best practices <coughs> for other states that have lower incarceration rates? I mean, what are they doing differently that Michigan is not doing so that they can achieve um, these lower incarceration rates? There is a uh, National Center for Justice that studied here, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if John Bebo mentioned that earlier, but they came back with some recommendations, must have been last spring, um, and they are the ones that, I mean, it, 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 they, they came out with a number of recommendations, and it is true, we put people away for longer. We, um, it costs us more to do that. We need to look at not just, uh, we need to look at the administrative side, but we also need to look at the sentencing guidelines and some of the reforms, and that makes people yeah. really, really nervous. But to your point, what was in the paper this morning, and I will tell you, I'm here this afternoon instead of this morning because I've been with the governor and Dylan and Bishop, and we keep going in circles, like how do we get to a compromise? And it is, they're all, I mean, I agree. We have to decide who we're mad at and who we're afraid of. And we have to get over who we're mad at right. and let some of them out. And those who we're afraid of, we need to keep them in. So, but there has to be a meeting of the minds, and there among those three parties doesn't seem to be a meeting of the minds right now. And when you have, there is a true element of fear out there by some, and then you take it on the prosecutors and some others. So there are a whole lot of pieces to the puzzle, but if you can get a handful of them together and, and just agree to put politics and some of the other things aside, maybe you can agree on something. I mean, the governor, I give her credit, has gone quite a ways in cutting some of the, uh, the corrections expenses. <coughs> Closed a number of prisons, um, but I mean, labor can you outsource some of the um some of the services and the labor costs are higher yeah i and, and I, I appreciate that <coughs> additional illumination uh, so, you, so you have looked at 
uh, comparisons and you've made some specific proposals to we, the They're not our proposals specific. There are some. We are, we are looking at, um, I mean, the Center for Michigan is really, and the Detroit Chamber have really taken on the corrections. I mean, really understood it and, and spent a lot of time on it. And the Center for Justice report outlined a number of things. Our folks show that you can come up with anywhere around $700 million in savings. So we're saying, okay, well, that's not going to happen. So could we get half? And could we start with even a smaller amount in the first year? I don't know if we can even get there. So The other area um, where I'm struggling, again, not with the concept, but with, you know, how you get from here to there is with respect to, um, to consolidation of services um, and, and really trying to understand how um, – how we we get to best practices that we don't um, <coughs> we, that we don't just look for consolidation for the sake of consolidation, but we look at consolidation that will actually produce mm -hmm. savings and try to do that on the basis of of results that we that we we've seen from other places. Because um, I, you know, I mean, you know, not to pick on on Detroit, but mm -hmm. you know, it's a big school mm -hmm. district, mm -hmm. right? And, and in fact, it's, you know, a lot of people would say um, part of its inefficiency is because it is so big, right? So you can, so is there is there a right size for school districts that that, that uh, seems to work? Um, is there a um, is there a model for doing this and and um, that, that would be data driven um, as opposed to sort of intuitive? I do not have that. I know. Um, just honestly from reading the papers there are a number of communities and some school districts that are doing it on their own because they have no choice right we are proposing to provide a carrot a little incentive financially with some of the extra money that we could get in the first couple of years to get them to try it mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then so they achieve some savings they get to keep them again I'm lumping in school districts local governments together but some of them are being forced to right now um, they don't have any choice my instinct is that that we could achieve a lot of savings by, you know, not having, um, you know, even if we didn't have four school districts in one small community, um, you know, that we, we could have, um, even if we didn't eliminate those lines because of the community involvement <coughs> reasons mm -hmm. that Dave Hecker talked about earlier, I don't know if you were here for that, mm -hmm. but but could there be one IT department? Sure. Um, could there be one human resources right. department? Could there right. be one payroll department as opposed to four separate systems. I, I mean, I again, intuitively, I think right. you, you can achieve some savings in that way, right. even if you don't break down all the barriers. Right. And so, um, I, but, but I'd like to know where, you know, I'd like to see some examples of how that's happened and where, yeah. you know, some longitudinal studies where people have implemented those kinds of changes and five years later, everybody oh agrees God, we yeah. saved money mm -hmm. by doing these things. I don't know if we've got that. I know that there have been, I've seen through, um, Center for Michigan examples on the local government side, I can certainly look into it and let you know. That would be great. That would be helpful. Kathleen. Yeah. I was interested in some of the things you're you're not for. <laughs> that would be what? <laughs> We're not for. <laughs> uh, I was interested that you said we cannot cut our way out of this situation. So solely right. solve the problem by cutting our way out. Yeah. So that coming from you, I think, is very significant. You know, we know the state can't live on $7 billion. I mean, and people are saying, well, let's just cut $2 billion, let's do this, let's do that. What are we left with? Right. You know, but like I said, so we have enemies everywhere. <laughs> well, I agree well, with that, but I'm, I'm very pleased places. to hear you as mm -hmm. your group yeah. saying that. Because well, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's why starting with that slide, we are very much invested here. It's really important that we have a well-run state, right. that we can attract other businesses here, that we have educated talent, you know, we have nice cities to live in. Yeah, and, and also just following up on what Reggie was just talking about, that, that we, you're focusing on consolidation of services rather than consolidation of districts right. per se. Because right. I think, yeah. too, that there's, it, it sounds easy, well, why don't you just consolidate districts? It's not as easy as it looks. It doesn't even sound easy. And, and <laughs> yeah, I know there's a big battle there somewhere. David was saying earlier that the community involvement and the community culture mm -hmm. creating clashes that might be more problems than they're worth. You know, they, they create other, other uh, uh, unintended consequences, so to speak. We, we are at such a critical point, and it's um, just a symbol of it, and I just I don't mean to um, offend any state employees in the room because, again, I was one for many years, but the, the whole issue right now where my members just cannot understand is this hanging 3% raise. 
So the state is facing a $1.7 billion budget deficit. And beyond that, I, mean, I don't know if you've looked at we are projecting numbers because we are trying to mold a package that would keep us in the black through 2014. Yeah. We haven't seen anybody doing that yet. But so the idea of you're cutting drastically over and over and over and relying, the governor's relying on a billion dollars in federal money to get us through this year, knowing there's a big cliff next year. How do you give a raise? Not whether people are deserving or not. It, you just look at General Motors. How, how do we change that thinking? To, we have to turn around and get ourselves on solid financial footing and then start putting some rewards in place. But, I mean, from what we're seeing, um, there is not a whole lot of a mindset to change it. And so some of our folks say, if, if we can't even get through that, is there hope for our state? Yeah. Any of these phone people? Any, any uh, Mary Ann or Nancy, please? As John says, these phone people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the phone people. The phone invisible phone. Phone. Right. <laughs> who, who insists on speaking today? Uh, um, I know I didn't have any questions. I'm happy to see um, there's a support there for um, extending the sales tax to uh, all services and. Um, I guess everything is probably on the table at this point. So, and I'm happy to um, hear the uh, discussions on reducing uh, sentences, uh, um, particularly, uh, well, just some of the more egregious ones, I guess. So, thank you, though, for coming. And I um, uh, appreciate your time and attention to this. To that this point. Is, the, is, it, um, is this an opportune time? Yes, it is. Question? Yeah. Okay, Sabrina, thanks so much for uh, your presentation. I'm sorry I didn't get to the very beginning of it, but I'll catch up with someone on that. Um, uh, you mentioned that uh, extending uh, ta the tax on services. Did I understand you correctly that you would uh, extend it to all services, or could you explain that a little bit more? Sure. It would extend to all services. It would exempt business to business services. It would exempt health care, education, and housing, and anything that is already taxed. Okay. So I don't if think you exempt the businesses, who would you then tax? You're taxing the consumer. You're taxing all the people that work in the businesses, but you're not, you're not taxing if you're buying a... Um, a service that you, that is in, embedded in uh, what you need to do to provide your business that would not be included. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And I need to just clarify this point. This is the Business Leaders from Michigan proposal. I'm not speaking for all the other business groups out there, so they would not necessarily be in agreement. Right. Can I mention just, I think, because you, you were clearly sincere on the um, kind of the, the way that your CEOs are looking at this 3% thing, and I'm, I'm, I don't report to the governor, but a cabinet meeting, it, it becomes clear that, for example, right now most of the unions have conceded uh, wages and benefits for this year. And the catch-22 is they have a contract in place for next year which would be dealt with at another time. I don't think it's, I don't think it's quite the mindset that it wouldn't be. And it's certainly not an automatic. I mean, this is bargaining units who in good faith have contracts in place and then have to. But I would just say kind of to counter, or not counter, but a little more information on that is, is virtually every group has agreed to cutbacks for this year. And it, it certainly would infer, perhaps, that uh, when that new contract comes up, they would be willing to look at the same thing. And I didn't want to not give them you know, credit for that. It's, it comes in the form of either pay cuts or furlough days and some others. And, I, and I'm pretty sure the governor, if I'm not mistaken, can't propose that because she's the one Correct. who did she, the bargain. She signed the contract, yep. But I think the legislature and others can, and that's that's kind of why that seems to be in limbo. It's a, it's a bit of a uh, contradiction in one sense that that's going on right now for the current year, but hanging out there is this right. possibility for something else. So I understand that. Yep. Liz, please. Yeah, I was just thinking in terms of, you know, our transforming our correctional system and trying to deal with people who have been convicted of crimes in new and different ways, the people don't really go away. They, you know, whether there's another alternative means of monitoring behavior and all of that. But I'm thinking it's not unlike uh, in the 80s when we transformed the institutional care system for people with developmental disabilities and 
And there was a resistant employee base and some communities because they had jobs and towns and everything. But at that time, we had really a very coordinated public information campaign around who the people were who would be moving back to the community. Plus, we trained people. They would need services in the community. So we actually trained the employees of the current institutional mm -hmm. system to become the executives of nonprofit organizations that would provide those services in the community. Today, there's a, a plethora of nonprofit organizations, and they are run by people who went through the training back in, in 1978 and 79. I still have the curriculum in my basement. I bet it would be applicable. But, but what we did, with, and that, it, it didn't make everybody happy, but, but we were able to deliberately transform a system of care and resulting um, downsizing of big institutional settings. And I know, I know Pat Caruso and the governor have worked very, very hard to try to bring down this population. But they have, right. and they've Sentencing done a great job. Sentencing guidelines, three strikes and you're out. These things just populate our prisons with, you know, very hard. I thought it was a great way you coined um, the, the phrase, in effect, <coughs> treat people we're mad at differently than those yeah. we're yeah. afraid of. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. I can't way take credit about. for it. I've, I'm hearing it a lot. I'm seeing it a lot in yeah. print. And it, but it's, true. it's and, true. And, you know, we can't continue to spend growing amounts of our limited state resources in the correction system. I mean, it's a really sad it statement it about our quiet. state. It doesn't. <laughs> You, you, know, net they, out. you know, if we switch the, the priorities, huh? it's so much cheaper to educate a uh, yeah. child than it is yeah. to house a bit of prison away. for the yeah. rest of his life or something. You know, it's interesting that on that count again, I know you've seen this stat, but we're actually down, when you take corrections out, state employee numbers are down 25,000 since the oh, 70s. Yeah. They and are yet down, yep. yeah. And yet the population, even with some of the recent decline, is up 800,000 since mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. So down. that's part of this conflict that it's hard for mm -hmm. folks to see with that ever-growing mm -hmm. corrections piece. But appreciate your noting it regularly because I've heard it in other forums. Mm -hmm. I know it wasn't just for this. Other board member comments or questions? Thank you so much. Thank for you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you yeah, enough for making very it. Good. Very good. Very helpful. We appreciate your being here very much. Thank you. Thanks for saying nice things about the United Way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we got through the business earlier, yes. so I think we're set to uh, have a bite at this point, right? Yeah. That's yeah. it.